30 uh, monthly seminar. <clears throat> and welcome both of you here in person as well as those of you online. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Herbacio Lamas or uh, Tony Lamas. Uh, he's the current chair of medicine. And the chief, he's the chair of medicine and the chief of the Columbia University Division of Cardiology. Very good. So he, he got his BA in Biomedical Sciences from Harvard College and medical uh, degree with honor from NYU. And his internship and residency and biology training at the Regan and Women's Hospital of Harvard Medical School. And there he started as an assistant professor. Uh, but growing up in South Florida, he had to go back to South Florida. I think today he, I, I, I was so excited with the weather and apparently our weather today is just Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he then returned to South Florida in 1993, uh, where he became the chief of cardiology at Mount Sinai. And in 2011, he became the chair of medicine. He's the fellow of the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the European College of uh, Society of Cardiology. And he has many, many awards. He, he has done many important clinical trials really relevant to the field of cardiology with very important papers. But I would like to highlight that he's really a champion of looking for science that is important, important for the patients, important for the public, important for public health, and also thinking a little bit outside of the box and not being afraid to pursue science that is difficult and that uh, not, not mainstream and not necessarily easy to do. So thank you. I'm going to let him talk about the TAC2 study and the creation work that is really the reason why we have him here. So thank you so much, Tony. Thank you, thank you so much, Anna. Got it, thank you. Okay. Perfect. Uh, first of all, um, do I need the mic? No, you're fine, right? Okay. Very good. So, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank Anna and uh, Andrea for this invitation. I really am honored. I have been working with uh, the Biorepository bio Lab uh, now for years. And um, what has been accomplished here just in one little corner of my uh, world is uh, not only essential in that progress would not be made without it, but also amazing that so much progress was, done, was made with such few people. Um, so let me get into this a little bit. And um, in terms of uh, background, I really am a clinical cardiologist who um, has an interest in clinical trials. I like to try things out and see if they work. And um, at the Brigham, when I was training, it was an era of the beginning of many of the big cardiovascular clinical trials. And so we would try new things out. and see how they work. And that's how I learned to um, sort of the, the methodology of clinical trials. Um, until I kind of stepped outside the box a bit with toxic metal chelation and cardiovascular disease and found that I had probably run into a black swan event. And we'll talk about what's a black swan event. And the black swan event really involved an elephant in the room, which we cardiologists don't like to know, but that is the elephant upon which all of you work. Along the way, there are many, many people um, that um, I need to thank. I won't go through them, but um, um, here, um, Annie, 
uh, Anna Navasasian, uh, has been uh, crucial. And I remember the day that I called her after TACT 1, after the study that I'll tell you about, um, uh, was complete and uh, published. And I said, my God, uh, this may be working because of uh, removal of toxic metals from the body. And I started looking up lead. And if you Google lead, you find uh, Anna. Uh, <laughs> so... Mm -hmm. <laughs> She was at Hopkins at the time, you know, led Hopkins. Dr. Navas Hassan sounded good, so gave her a call. Uh, she has a wonderfully receptive and open personality. And we hit it off, and here we are working together, you know, more than a decade later. So the problem, I, the conceptual problem is that the information that all of us work on um, is really captive in silos. And so what do I mean by that? Well, um, I'm going to be talking about chelation, right? So um, chelation was principally the province of complementary and alternative medicine doctors who would treat patients with uh, usually EDTA or other chelating agents for a variety of diseases, but without clear evidence that it was beneficial uh, they would publish case reports and case series in their own journals, which I don't read, um, and which probably you don't read either. Um, the epidemiologists, public health experts, toxicologists uh, would study uh, metals and give us, um, let us know how polluted the environment is. Um, what the consequences of that are. And the basic scientists would tell us why, in fact, lead, cadmium, et cetera, are toxic at the molecular level. I don't actually read a whole lot of toxicology journals, although to my surprise, I found myself publishing in one. Um, and cardiologists don't read a lot of clinical cardiologists, clinical trialists don't read a lot of public health. The diabetologists knew that to, to produce advanced glycation end products, which are the cross-linked uh, modified glucose molecules that probably are why diabetes is such a bad thing, having high blood sugar is such a bad thing. Um, they knew that you need to produce these uh, ages, uh, advanced glycation end products, you need um, metal catalyzed oxygen chemistry. Otherwise they tend not to happen. Um, but that's kind of basic science of diabetes. You know, cardiologists don't really read that. Cardiologists, we do make a lot of noise. Um, and we fix things uh, mechanically. You know, you put a stent in it, you stick a valve in it, and boy, the problem is fixed. Not really, right? Um, we inhibit platelets so it doesn't clot, and we lower cholesterol. And what I was interested in was not a mechanical solution, it was not platelets, it was not cholesterol. And so all of a sudden you're stuck with the darn silos again, information that we do not share and we continue not to share. Now, if you say there's an elephant in the room, you mean that there's an obvious problem or difficult situation that people do not want. But no, of course, anyone here who is married knows that every once in a while there's an elephant in the room. Um, but in science, um, the elephant in the room um, is this. There's really near universal contamination with vasculotoxic metals. And if you ask cardiologists about this, they do not know this. They really don't. They think that, it's, that you're just a little off if you say, you know, lead and cadmium are pretty bad for the arteries. Um, and that's still true. There is extensive epidemiological evidence showing adverse cardiovascular effects of metals. This is obviously incomplete. Um, Anna was nice enough to give me this slide because I couldn't find a periodic table. Um, it was not applicable to my world at that time. Um, and I put in yellow the two that are most efficiently chelated by um, EDTA which is a very efficient polydentate chelator. 
So where was I when I stepped through the looking glass into your world? I did not know that uh, metals were cardiovascular toxicants, did not know this at all. I mean, I knew that lead was bad for children and it caused some neurological problems. Uh, I figured you shouldn't eat cadmium, but I didn't know why. Um, and I thought that chelation was uh, quackery, uh, an unscientific practice that should be stopped. A black swan event is an outlier. It lies outside the realm of regular expectations. It carries an extreme impact. And you, we find reasons for it retrospectively. And that's precisely what uh, the last 20 odd years have uh, um, shown me in a, in a nutshell. And that black swan event was really precipitated by the use of uh, EDTA in a scientific fashion um, with uh, a randomized and now two randomized clinical trials. So when I simplify this for cardiologists, I say, well, look, metals cause toxicity by replacing essential divalent cations with vi in vital intracellular reactions, and they each have direct toxic effects. And they say, oh, okay. So this can be, this is believable even to the most skeptical and or hard-headed clinician. Lead is associated, as you know, with hypertension, stroke, myocardial infarction, or mortality. Principal storage in bone, once in bone, half-life is about 30 years. Cadmium associated with CAD, cerebral vascular disease, and particularly peripheral artery disease. Peripheral artery disease is nasty. It leads to amputations. If you have your limb amputated when you're in your 70s, your life is over. You just never, you never rehab out of that, uh, no matter what. And the amputations always occur again. Strong vascular, strong mechanistic and experimental evidence, as we uh, uh, talked about, that supports this. So, is this new? Well, not exactly. 1886, uh, Saturnine gout, its distinguishing marks, arterial thickening and degeneration, premature aging of the arterial system. So I'm not talking about anything that I have discovered, certainly. Um, if I've been an agent to break up some of those silos, that's, and, um, that's the only credit that I would deserve, other than the fact that I'm actually moderately stubborn, maybe severely stubborn, in order to pursue this. Um, and these are papers that I am certain that you have uh, read, perused, et cetera, but Lancet Public Health, Cardiologists don't necessarily read this, but what did that show? That paper um, used a fairly complex statistical methodology to uh, conclude that the lead attributable risk uh, for all-cause mortality in the U.S. was 412,000 deaths annually. Uh, cardiovascular disease mortality, about a quarter million deaths. Ischemic heart disease mortality, what I really take care of, about 185,000 deaths annually. That's pretty amazing. And we're not concentrating on that in cardiology. We lower LDL very well, we inhibit platelets, and we put in stents, and now we put in a heart balance. Um, this is an EWAS peripheral artery disease from NHANES. What's number one? Cadmium. Cadmium and Peripheral artery disease are seemingly inextricably bound. Another study, um, a systematic review and meta-analysis for risk of cardiovascular disease. 37 studies, 348,000 unique participants, exposure to arsenic, lead, cadmium, and copper associated with an increased risk and the internal check really is the linear dose response relationship. And that was for arsenic, lead, and cadmium. So these are cardiovascular risk factors. And while I don't uh, by any means say that I shouldn't be trying to lower LDL uh, and inhibit platelets, um, by no means should I be ignoring these either if I want to be an effective cardiologist. So what happens if you give EDTA to someone? Um, these were 
um, about 30 uh, male um, individuals in my clinical practice who had had a prior myocardial infarction who received an infusion of um, um, either uh, of placebo or uh, three grams of disodium EDTA or editate disodium, as the, which is the uh, FDA um, okay. nomenclature. Um, and uh, we're looking at micrograms of metal per gram of creatinine. At baseline, everybody has a lot of metals at relatively low doses. And anybody who was alive um, during the time of leaded gasoline, for sure, is carrying some of that old leaded gasoline in them, or at least the lead from the leaded gasoline, tetraethyl lead. And what happens when you give EDTA? You, by the next morning, you have about uh, close to 4,000% more lead in your urine and about 700% more lead in your urine, more cadmium in your urine. Um, so this is pretty powerful. Um, this, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Now, did anybody else uh, think of trying to do a clinical trial on this? Well, again, like I said, I'm not discovering anything. This is 1956. In 1956, I was four years old. I was wearing short pants in Cuba and Havana and chasing lizards, as <laughs> little Cuban children do in the summer, which is always. Um, and so, um, on the other hand, these uh, folks gave um, EDTA to uh, about 20 patients with severe coronary disease. Now, think of coronary disease in 1956. There are, are no, people are not taking aspirin. There are no statins to lower cholesterol. There are no beta blockers to lower your heart rate. And all you have really um, is nitroglycerin, which you put under your tongue when your chest hurts. Um, when you reach the autopsy table, um, as usually you would if you had coronary disease, um, the coronaries are extensively calcified. So their idea was, well, maybe if we can decalcify the coronaries with this stuff that takes out calcium and other divalent cations. And about 19 of those patients got better, less chest pain, fewer electrocardiographic changes. And it briefly, EDTA entered conventional cardiology briefly. And then there were a couple of studies that were not quite positive. And then it exited into the world of alternative medicine sometime in the 70s, around the time the coronary bypass uh, was developed. And uh, soon thereafter, beta blockers were used to treat angina. And there you go. And there it stayed. So how did the trial to assess chelation therapy start? There was a lot of uh, serendipity. So in the late 1990s, the US Congress became interested in having the NIH study chelation. Um, but there was no uh, trialist with a trial record ever stepped up and said, listen, I'm interested in this. In 1999, a patient asked me, it was August, a patient asked me for chelation, and I said that it was nonsense. Um, but I usually am uh, kinder, and so, uh, or at least more science-based. And so I kind of looked up uh, chelation and realized that, you know what? Um, I can't make that statement. I can't make the converse either. I mean, I can't say that it works. Uh, there weren't data. So um, I uh, called a deputy director of NHLBI and asked if they were interested in a study. At about the same time, the Congress was putting pressure on them. And he said, yeah, why don't you put something together? Um, and I submitted an R01 in 2000. It was uh, with Duke as my data coordinating center, we're probably not funded, and that was completely appropriate because we were really not ready. This was a very, very infrastructure-heavy uh, trial, and I just wasn't ready. On the other hand, what occurred is that they said, listen, don't resubmit. We are going to put out an RFA. 
And um, in 2001, NIH releases a $30 million RFA. By that time, I had already figured out the infrastructure part. Um, and working with Duke, just we had it. Uh, EDTA for atherosclerosis used the most prevalent uh, mixture in the community. And that comes up a little later why that's important. <clears throat> Work with alternative medicine organizations and physicians to put this together. Uh, secure an IND from the FDA, which I did. And all of us, every single person, every single conventional physician here thought that this study would be negative or stopped due to harm. All of us. We went into it saying we're going to stop the practice of chelation therapy because it's probably dangerous to the public or at the very least a waste of money. The award was released to us in 2002 and patient number one was randomized in 2003. And here I sit nearly 20 years later. So what I found when I spoke with the chelation practitioners is that they always gave really high doses of vitamins and minerals uh, with chelation. So we designed a factorial trial. So in blue versus red is IV chelation versus IV placebo, okay? The chelation regimen was three grams of disodium EDTA plus some other additives weekly, roughly for uh, 30 weeks, and then once every two weeks to two months for the next 10. So just think that, realize that by 18 months, nobody's getting anything else. Uh, but they are also part of this uh, vitamin factorial trial, which I am not really going to spend time on because then it just the talk is just too long. Um, and but just so you understand how the study was was done. Now, light blue versus orange, you go high dose oral vitamins versus uh, oral placebo. Okay. And the interesting part would have been or was really uh, active active versus placebo placebo. Right, the people in the bottom right, they're my good patients, the ones that do what I tell them, they take their statin and aspirin, and then they go home and they take their statin and aspirin. The guys at the top, they take their statin and aspirin, and then they hang a left and go to the chelation doctor, right? Um, they sort of do Eligibility was age 50 or older. Am I at least 50, at least six weeks uh, prior, creatinine, um, at least um, two or less. The relevance, uh, um, there is well over half a million new heart attack survivors annually. A couple of hundred thousand have diabetes and this piles up over the years. The vital stats was a $30 million grant. It took 10 years, 1,708 patients in the US and Canada, 134 sites, and we gave a total of 55,222 infusions. When I talk about infrastructure, that's really where the, it was infrastructure heavy. So the drug, all of the bags were made um, in a compounding pharmacy outside Miami. The ones that were sent to Canada, because we had Health Canada approval, were approved uh, by customs while in the air in FedEx. So when they landed, there was no delay in getting to the site. So just setting that up was really uh, nightmarish, but it could be done. The infusions uh, were complicated um, because that was what was used by the alternative medicine practitioners and that's what we had been asked to use. So just take a look at the active uh, disodium EDTA infusion is three grams given over three hours. It also had seven grams of vitamin C. It also had two grams of uh, magnesium, vitamins, etc. So it's this is not a clean, clean, clean experiment. The primary endpoint uh, was a composite endpoint. The first occurrence of death 
MI, stroke, coronary revascularization, or hospitalization for unstable angina. This is the a time to first event uh, analysis. Um, and then I'll show you some of the uh, um, uh, all events analyses as well. This is the baseline characteristics of the patients. Remember, this is this was published in uh, 2012. And so it's now 10 years old, obviously. Uh, we keep cholesterol lower than this at this point. Nonetheless, um, you can see the age um, and uh, a little over a third had diabetes. Um, most patients were on statins, et cetera. And I presented this in uh, 2012 at the American Heart Association. Um, that was on, in a uh, November. Um, and these are the TACT primary endpoint results. Now, remember that this study was supposed to be negative. And I have been blinded for 10 years. It's a double blind trial. So I've been blinded for 10 years and I was unblinded about six weeks before this presentation in a room kind of like this at Duke, at the Duke Clinical Research Institute. There are about six of the clinical leadership and maybe 10 statisticians, et cetera. And they come out with their books, they give them to you, and then, but they leave out the, the, they leave out this. And then eventually they bring this out and you look at it and you say, oh no, this darn thing is positive. And the first thing I asked was, did you get the groups right? I said, yes, we checked it twice. Um, the next thing was that I put my hands on my head and I said, oh no, because I knew I would have to do it again. <laughs> um, so I show this at the American Heart Association, a room with about 3,000 people in it. Um, everybody sucks the air in because it's supposed to be negative. I'm at a podium with really luminaries of cardiology next to me. I was not one of them, but there were luminaries of cardiology. And as I come back to the podium after presenting this, you know, at the at the dais, sorry, um, people move away from me an inch or two, but perceptible. <laughs> um, and the next day, uh, this was an 18% relative reduction in risk, which is really, you know, kind of roughly what you get out of a statin. Um, so the next day, there's always like a little convention newspaper. Oh, and remember, at this point, that's when the infusion stopped. Mm -hmm. So it is as if you had reset these people somehow by removing something that they had taken a lifetime to accumulate. You, re you reset them. Everybody was upset. This is President Snow, as some of you may know. Um, and this is a little newspaper. Dismay <laughs> reads positive chelation study. What the heck? Are we on the favor of disease now? Uh, can we be scientific and admit to ourselves that an unexpected result is so much more interesting than an expected result? Analysis of patients with diabetes at baseline was uh, pre-specified. Actually, when we were, before I presented that, um, I called uh, your former dean, uh, Lee Goldman. And I, I'd known Lee since uh, I was at the Brigham, since 78. He was my first CCU attending. Um, and I said, uh, you know, Lee, there's going to be some flack here because the, the results are unexpected. He said, well, you know what, Tony, that's why you do research. Which was wise, and it kept me focused. Um, analysis of patients with diabetes at baseline was pre-specified. And that was really the black swan event. This is placebo. Uh, vertical axis is um, the composite primary endpoint that I showed you. And the horizontal axis is uh, time uh, up to about five years. It was an enormous effect. It was a... Um, the hazard ratio was 0.59, so 41% relative reduction in risk. Um, the number needed to treat 
to prevent one event was a little over six uh, over the course of five years. Extraordinary. And remember, at that point, the infusions have stopped as if you had reset them. You took out something that they spent their lives ingesting. What about the non-diabetics? Well, as you can see, they have fewer events um, appropriately. So that's a good internal test. And not that much of an effect. You can pick out subgroups of the non-diabetics that seem to have an effect, but um, the effect seems to be principally in diabetic patients. And if you look at the diabetics and the non-diabetics and try to make a composite slide, you see that what you have done is you've taken these diabetic patients and given them the event rate of a non-diabetic coronary patient. So it is the added risk that we were able to remove, the added risk. What about the holy grail of uh, clinical trials, which is all-cause mortality, a reduction of 43% relative reduction of risk um, with a p-value of a one. When you parse out the clinical events, this is a cardiovascular death and myer stroke reduced by about 40%. MI by about half, myocardial infarction. And um, coronary revascularization is by about a third. So very consistent, very consistent data. Um, let's look at the multiple events analyses. That adds actually about another 30% of events. So, and I think this is a more patient-centered analysis, if you will. If you just go in and you have, uh, with unstable angina, you get a stent and, you're, and you leave, you know, that's, I mean, that's scary, but it's not quite so bad as you go in with chest pain, you have an MI, you have a stent, then you need coronary bypass, then you're in heart failure for the rest of the year, and then you die. That one, somehow we always, we do need to try to capture um, all of the events. So what you find when you do this is, and you know, we can just look at the EDTA versus placebo column. Um, you get a little bit more uh, oomph in terms of reduction. In the diabetes subgroup, it's still about the same. So I had a top line meeting with the FDA in 2014 with a group from uh, Duke and a group from um, uh, NIH. And uh, they reviewed the study design and the results, and they said the study was positive, the drug is safe, they would not discourage a new drug application. Um, but they said, but you know what? We prefer you do it again, which is why I was upset the study was positive. Um, and by the way, this metal thing is interesting. Why don't you explore that? Hence um, why we are talking. So how do we interpret this? So it's likely that toxic metal pollutants are a modifiable risk factor. I think that the work that you folks have done show very clearly that it is a risk factor, but that it is a modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And that's really, that word is really what's key uh, for a clinical cardiologist sitting in a room with a coronary patient. We have to focus on TAC as maybe heralding the potential rise of a disruptive pharmacology. Why, why disruptive? Well, because it focuses on the exposome, which we don't really focus on, number one. And number two, it suggests that we should be developing pharmacology um, for taking out efficiently and not in, not in such an annoying way with an IV, um, these uh, toxic metals even though we, we do have oral chelating agents, but again, I was uh, shackled a little bit uh, by the uh, RFA, the original RFA. And replicate clinical results 
in the population with diabetes and prior MI, which is what the FDA had said, and then work out the mechanisms. So back to the uh, back to uh, asking for money. And um, September 27, 2016, with the very active help of Dr. Navas Hacien, um, we were approved and granted $36 million uh, to do TAC2. And the black swan appears again, right? Um, and this was to be a replicative trial of IV chelation and oral vitamins in 1,000 post-MI diabetic patients. Strong mechanistic component, uh, which is what you folks have done. Um, and, um, you know, uh, just ex extraordinary work that's been done here. I, I know you do it every day. Maybe you don't know it's extraordinary, but it is. Um, Tact enrolled 1,000 patients. We made it through the pandemic. Uh, we stopped enrolling only for about a month, um, then continued infusing and enrolling. We gave about a th over 31,000 infusions and we'll follow patients a little under one more year. So we're in the follow-up phase. The last infusion was uh, given um, a little under a year ago. And I'm still blinded, so I don't know. So don't expect another couple of minor curves. <laughs> Ain't coming. <laughs> So the biorepository at Columbia University deserves enormous credit. Uh, they process and stored biospecimens from uh, measuring metals and testing mechanistic hypotheses. Um, how many how many biospecimens did you get? We have like uh, at least uh, five thousand blood samples, or four thousand blood samples, and, and double of the urine samples. Yeah. Um, the way that it worked is that uh, the Columbia Biorepository shipped whole blood and urine. So the site is shipped to Columbia, gets organized, uh, and then they ship to um, CDC uh, for analysis using established Enhanced Metals panels. And um, it was uh, blood was uh, lead, cadmium, uh, cobalt, chromium, mercury, manganese, and selenium. We do have manganese. Yeah. And then you can see the pre and post infusion urine. So we have a lot of metals, not all the ones that we would want, um, but uh, we have a whole lot more than in the first study where no one would give me any more money to measure metals because the study was supposed to be negative. Um, and this is, again, the, the pre-infusion, blood and pre-infusion and, and pre- and post-infusion urine collected infusions 1, 5, 20, and 40, or one year. So about 90% about of patients have complete uh, metals uh, data. The specific aims of the metals assessments are to evaluate the role of chelation of cardiotoxic metals as potential mechanisms for the cardiovascular benefits of EDTA, and conduct pre-specified risk stratification analyses by baseline metal levels, and also observe the changes in metal levels over time, and provide a long-term biorepository, which is where you folks still come in, because there are a lot of experiments and ideas that we all want to do um, on the specimens that remain here. So in the meantime, um, I was born. <laughs> and um, this, by the way, is winter in Miami, okay? <laughs> Today was a deep winter day. I took out my very heaviest coat. Um, and also spurred not just by boredom, but by uh, this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, of a tiny number, a tiny subset. These are patients who had intact one, but diabetes, who had a prior MI, and also self-reported peripheral artery disease. You can see that the, these curves are uh, outrageous. Um, so I asked for some funds 
from my hospital uh, for patients who had uh, critical limb threatening ischemia to see if um, patients who had really the microvascular disease of diabetes and of the, of the diabetic foot um, could be treated. Um, and that paper came out um, some years back. You will, all of you published, you'll say, what journal is this? Um, this is a journal called Curious. And it was the only journal that would publish this. In traditional cardiology journals, they wouldn't even look at it. They said, no, we don't know about this. It doesn't really. So what we did is we took 10 patients who either had chronic ischemic pain or were about to lose a foot or one of, the, one of their toes and did an open label study where they received up to 50 infusions of EDTA. Because they were about to lose their, uh, their feet or toes, we did, for the first 20 infusions, we did two per week. So this was my first patient. This was a patient of mine. You can tell that she has, in fact, lost all of her toes um, on her foot. And this, uh, her big toe, it has gangrene. Um, and um, infusion 21, infusion 45. Um, I saw this, this was years ago, right? I saw her a couple of years ago. She still had both feet on. Now, take a look at how much lead came out after the first infusion. That's the baseline. That's the very first infusion. 8,000% more lead than at baseline. This is an elderly woman about to lose her foot in Miami Beach. We have no lead mines there. So who absorbs lead? Um, who retains it? Again, is something that we need to work on. It's not pretty, but it is functional. You can put a shoe on that foot. That woman, the last time that I saw her in the office, she walked out and left her walker in my office and I had to call her, say, hey, what's the story? This gentleman um, had an ulcer. You can see he has four toes only on this foot. So he's already had a ray amputation of his second toe. And now he has an ulcer. He, the foot is also sort of pink and shiny. It's ischemic. And they've already told him he's probably going to lose the next toe. Um, he also uh, was um, having a little uh, dementia. Uh, given that he had microvascular disease, probably vascular dementia. You can see after infusion 50, um, that foot looks normal. Um, he passed away a couple of years ago, because uh, this is a while back. And um, he never had problems with his legs again. What did occur that was interesting in him is that he was a bit demented. And when I wanted to stop at 40 infusions, which was the original protocol, um, the caregiver said, don't stop because his dementia is better. He's a lot more interactive, et cetera. Fine. Um, you know, you just hear these things and put them in the back of your mind. Maybe they'll be true, maybe they won't. This gentleman had um, uh, really no uh, further um, surgical or interventional options and was scheduled to lose his foot. Um, he had a surgical schedule for a below the knee amputation. Um, and uh, his cardiologist, they heard the wife, um, wives have been very, you know, they're, they're the, the, the critical caregiver for these, uh, for these men. Um, wife had heard that I was doing this uh, experiment and asked 
her cardiologist was a colleague of mine. Should he be part of it? What my colleague said was, of course not. That stuff doesn't work. Okay, this is after the publication before, which he obviously didn't read or didn't believe. Um, but not believing can carry some serious cost uh, for a patient. This man's in his 80s. He is also a bit demented, probably vascular dementia. And that's after 45 or 50 infusions. You can see the scar where this lesion was. And that's from above. Um, so this then became the next mission. Um, and so far, we have not been able to get funding, believe it or not. So um, another mission was to have somebody other than me or my team be the ones that did this, right? Um, because it's starting to get a little too, it was starting to get weird. So a friend of mine in Argentina called up and said, hey, I've seen some of these pictures. I have a patient that you know, might be eligible. Uh, can you tell me what you're putting in them? Even though it's always been published, right? Um, and so he started, um, uh, this was a, a patient. You can see blood supply ends above the ankle. This is the contrast column. This is her foot. She also was scheduled for an amputation uh, by the time he got to her. Just keep track of the lesions, this one and this one. I asked them not to take off this toe because I wanted to see what would happen to it. Um, and it didn't hurt, it wasn't hurting her. So remember this little ulceration is gone. Um, this is pretty well gone. And this is how it ended. The mummified toe fell off. Uh, she can put a shoe on. She moved out to the country, and the last I heard, she was doing well. We're really quite happy. So the world is changing a little bit. This is an article, a viewpoint article, that uh, Dr. Navas Asien, um, a cardiology fellow who has been central in this, um, and I uh, wrote on lead and cadmium as cardiovascular risk factor if the burden of proof has been met. Um, and I think that um, we need to realize uh, as cardiologists that toxic metals uh, may be uh, modifiable atherosclerotic risk factors. And which brought to mind my favorite Victor Hugo quote, which is, all the forces in the world are not so powerful as an idea whose time has come. Because um, you, you can't keep this progress back. So where to now? Uh, the research plan is, you know, it's lengthy. And um, we need to move this along. Tack two, we need to get the results. I hope that they'll be positive. Uh, or I'll be uh, up here eating crow. Um, and we need to get uh, funding for um, a good PAD, critical limb ischemia study, um, do a pilot study of cognitive function, and then perhaps pursue that. And all of that happens um, before I look like uh, this fellow from The Hobbit. Gandalf, I believe. So um, I want to thank you um, very much for really giving me the privilege to uh, speak with you. Uh, this is a serious uh, group of scientists, and I am very grateful uh, for the part that you have taken in all this. Thanks. Yes. Uh, I have two questions for you. One is 
So in the people with diabetes, for example, that has such remarkable effects. So what about the other like known um, players? Is it is the metal chelation working by lowering glucose, say, or- I think that's a, yeah, that great question. Like great question that I should have uh, addressed. Um, we did not have hemoglobin A1C in that study mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in TACT-1. Uh, however, uh, we did have multiple points of fasting blood sugar, mm -hmm. and they were identical. Mm -hmm. We also had medications, and the number of patients on insulin, for example, was identical in the beginning and in the end. Uh -huh. um, okay. So this does not work through... Yeah. Um, um, modifying glycemia. Yeah. Um, and the studies in uh, modifying glycemia really have a much longer time frame uh, for showing benefit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Second question is um, coming back to what you said in the introduction about people who were alive during the time of leaded gasoline. And do you think, you know, you enrolled people who are all 50 and older, you know, which was already 20 years ago. So do you think this is, this is, part of what, what happened here is such dramatic effects because they happen to be people that were exposed to really high levels of something like lead. I think and that, um, you know, Anna, perhaps you can say something about what, what the baseline lead levels were. Remember, we're just getting, beginning to get some data back. Mm -hmm. So we have some idea what the, what the lead levels are, but lead levels since in the era of uh, leaded gasoline, lead levels were very high. And when leaded gasoline went away uh, and leaded paint was made uh, illegal, they went way down. Yeah. But still, even at the current lowish levels, it is better to have a low lead level than yeah. be at the upper range of normal. There is no safe lead level. That being the point, and what are, what are we seeing in the baseline yes, lead? Yes, yesterday we got the baseline. As as Tony mentioned, we are totally blinded for the study, but the baseline metals we are able to see them mm -hmm. uh, for the first time. Not even by treatment group, they don't let us uh, yeah. say that, but at least overall for the study, and the levels look very similar to what enhanced uh, data with mm -hmm. lead. And uh, like I will mean, recall, I think lead on average was like the one point something and like orange per deciliter. And, but there were people, we can see participants who had 10, mm -hmm. uh, five, three, yeah. uh, four. In that range, there are a lot of participants. And these are mm -hmm. people running in the street who have an MI, you know? Mm -hmm. We are not looking for them in any particular uh, manner. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lead exposure is very common. Yeah for many different routes yeah. uh, and sources. So we are all exposed to lead mm -hmm. at low levels. And this is not an element that we should have been exposed because mm -hmm. evolutionary, there was no lead uh, mm -hmm. for life and the earth. Mm -hmm. So this is this is really a, a real toxic metal that we cannot deal with very well. Mm -hmm. And it's true for humans and it's true for birds. Like there is a huge problem with the pollution of birds with mm -hmm. lead. And that has been known for, for decades. Mm. Uh, and, and so this is this is a real issue, the problem of lead toxicity. Mm. So. There are some questions, I think, in the chat. Well, that's been me telling people that they Oh, you're, you're telling me. You're telling me. Okay, okay. It's a question from Andrea. Can I Andrea. Yes. Nancy. Why do you think it was that Congress was suddenly interested in chelation? Funding. I have my own theory, but I can't. I really don't want to say it in a recorded <laughs> session. And I'll, I'll tell you my theory later. <laughs> or when the recording stops. <laughs> Carolina is the controller of the recording. I was really impressed by the results of your PAD small series of trials. Yeah. Particularly because when I Think about lead and cardiovascular disease, always talk about chronic long term effects. Instead, there it seems like then in a few weeks or months, you see dramatic changes. Yeah. After at, at infusion five, the ones that are going to be these, somehow I was able to collect hyper responders, right? Um, but without prior knowledge, really, because again, it was supposed to be negative. Um, 
at at about five infusions, between five and ten, but sometimes as early as five, they say, you know, I'm feeling a little better. And so, where is the, if it's lead, where is the bio repository of that lead that is allowing the microcirculation to work a little better, or is early on? are we actually chelating calcium because diabetics really have calcified arteries? So you, you didn't think it's an immediate uh, order? It was it's short, it's just so short, you know, two, three weeks. Right. And they say, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm sleeping a little better. I woke up fewer times last night because these people who have this amount of peripheral artery disease have not slept through the night in years. But when you quit smoking, the cardiovascular benefits are very fast when you quit mm -hmm. smoking. So in a way, it's removing a source, removing something in there. So I am not very surprised. Mm -hmm. That's another one. So um, what do you think about the fact that you see such benefits on both macro and microvascular complications, which I guess in diabetes, I mean, sometimes we think those might be totally different mechanisms. I don't know. What do you, what do you think? Um, I'm, I've been puzzled um, by it because um, the reduction in myocardial infarction was uh, tremendous. And that really is a, a macrovascular complication. And the benefit in the microcirculation of the feet was extensive. Mm -hmm. Um, I would not rule out um, that there are multiple mechanisms at play uh, here, given the complexity of the infusions that they were getting also. Yeah. So we can't blind ourselves and say, okay, you know, lead is the answer. Um, there may be more going on uh, than, than we, than necessarily meets our eye. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can I, can I make this so much in full one hour lecture? But could you please comment on the chelation arm that did not receive the high dose multivitamin? Sure. Um, the chelation arm, the high dose multivitamins, if you just look at the factorial, at that factorial, um, there was a 9% relative risk reduction of events by the high dose multivitamins, which was really, uh, which was a uh, p-value of 0.2 or 0.3. Um, yeah, but we were not powered to detect such a difference. So that difference, if it was true, lost. <clears throat> However, whenever you put in the, the vitamins plus chelation, you get another relative risk reduction of 9% or so. So let me, um, can you go back to the presentation? And we are, I know that we are extra time, so if people have to go, please feel free to do this because I, I know that people have other meetings and many other things. Yeah, please, by all means, don't don't let me keep you. And as I, as I told you, I, I'm not sensitive, anyways. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah, just like that. Right. Right. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, so this is the um. Let's stick with the, the plain cock. So time to the first event, right? This is what I showed you originally was that 18% relative reduction in risk with p-value of 035. But when you do EDTA plus multivitamins versus placebo placebo, you're now increasing the, um, the relative reduction in risk to 26%, then the p-value is now 0.016, even though you're only analyzing half of the population. So the vitamins 
in this seem to have added, but it's flimsy. So, you know, it's certainly not, and the, the vitamin uh, arm is just a very tough arm. Um, like most cardiologists, I don't know anything about vitamins. Um, and so what I did is that I um, selected a committee of vitamin experts from the alternative medicine world. And they came up with these vitamins, uh, which required uh, six very large pills to be taken every day. Uh, so this is the highest dose of vitamins ever used in a human experiment, in a clinical human clinical trial. So I don't know, it confused me, but that's really why we included it in TAC2, because I was desperate to, to de-link the vitamins from the chelation. And can I discuss that in your PA studies that you included multivitamins? We gave them, yes, we gave them multivitamins. But not, 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 um, you know, not uh, uh, in a factorial way. They just, they just gave them. You gave them the six pills? Yeah, the six, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were all on pills. There's a question online from Dr. Stephen Chilred. How does the chelation treatment time period compare to the half-life of lead in bone reservoirs? Would treating for longer help more? So the, the question is very good. That is the half-life of lead uh, left to our own devices. And I've learned this from Dr. Navas Asien that um, lead um, you know, originally existed deep in the earth's crust. Uh, we brought it to the surface. Since we brought it to the surface, there has been insufficient time to evolve mechanisms to get rid of lead from our body. And so it sits in our body. It goes into bone, uh, primarily as the principal reservoir of lead. And there, the half-life is somewhere in the 30-year range. Um, so why should, it, why should this work? I mean, if there is a big reservoir. Um, and... Um, I can tell you that um, we have looked at our patients who have received either clinical chelation or chelation as part of other studies. Um, and we find that after about 40 infusions, the uh, amount of lead that you are taking out with each infusion diminishes uh, perceptibly. And the baseline lead that you see in the urine also um, is reduced uh, with statistical significance. So whether we are uh, emptying uh, one reservoir that has not yet gone into a more permanent one, um, or we are actually being able to uh, deal with um, the overall larger reservoir, I can't I can't answer that. We have a small study coming up um, in which I will probably be a volunteer since I volunteer for all my studies when I am knowledgeable. I haven't had a heart attack yet. Um, and uh, in which we will give infusions and then sample lead in the urine for several days. EDTA should be gone by the next day. It really should be. Um, and that's what the pharmacokinetics of it are, but uh, perhaps EDTA with lead on it, that is captured lead, has a slightly longer um, half-life. We'll see. I think uh, we should finish. This was a wonderful thing to do. Anna, thank you. I'm very grateful.